Hello, 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 and welcome to the Loudcast with me, your host, Kevin McLean. I am still here, still in my flat and leaf, still bringing you some of the very best of spoken word. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Loudcast. If you are watching this on YouTube, then please do make sure to hit that like button, hit subscribe, and make sure to ring the bell icon so you don't miss any videos that we put out. We are so close to a thousand subscribers, guys, so please do help us get over that hurdle. It'll mean a huge amount to us. And if you are listening on a podcast, Podcast platform of your choice, then please do make sure to rate and review and, you know, follow all that good stuff. I don't really know how podcasts work, whatever. Uh, but we are here in the Loudcast and we've got an amazing episode for you in return for all your likes and subscribes and good things. Uh, so yeah, we are going to be chatting to the wonderful Jenny Folds, who is the current Scottish Slam champion, a tremendous writer and performer with a fascinating backstory of how she kind of found her way into the spoken word scene. Uh, and it's amazing to see all the things she has done since she stumbled her way in. Uh, yeah, she's been running a night down in uh, London, uh, Rebel Soapbox, absolutely phenomenal. She's been doing a, a huge amount of stuff and we are going to pick her brains about all of it. But before that, we have some spoken word poetry for you. And what better way to kick off than with the incredible Nadine Aisha Jasset. Uh, she performed back with us a couple of years ago when, you know, we could do shows and things like that and this is a, a stunning standout piece from that performance she had with us this is somewhere today i scroll facebook first then twitter refresh instagram until it tells me there's nothing more for me to see i'm all caught up so i return to my news feed and consider getting out of bed reflect that even my rhymes turning lazy as my body sinks low like a metal I refuse to name and my life hovers in the haze. Somewhere in this world a woman is falling in love for the first time. She is wondering how she got to be so lucky and her heart is so full that it forgets for a moment the weight of being lonely and it rises straight out of her chest. Somewhere a group of friends are having the best night of their lives, are screaming it from the top of their invincible, inexhaustible lungs, are holding on to each other as if it will always be this way, their smiles joined from cheek to cheek to cheek like a concertinaed ribbon, like a celebration parade. Somewhere there is an adventurer paused at the top of their climb, taking in the view and the road behind and saying to themselves even if this is my very last day even if i go it will be okay i came here to do what i do my life my life and i have been all of those people once my heart has been high my smile has lived in faces other than mine I have known the fulfillment which brings peace enough to accept all future rest. But today, I am these heavy hands only, and moving in a room that feels half immune to time, me via the clock on the wall which presumes its own pace. Looking for something, I pick up my phone again, and in its dark reflection, I meet my own fading face. Nadine there with a spellbinding piece. She's just such an enigmatic performer, that kind of like very calm and collected, very soft-spoken performance. But it's uh, it's an old wrestling thing. I know Katie's going to be annoyed because I've just mentioned wrestling, but it's Jake the Snake Roberts in a time of sort of huge shouting cokeheads. He whispered and it made people listen. And I, I think when you see performers like Nadine, hey, it totally rings true to that. You don't always need to be loud, <laughs> loud, <laughs> hey, to, to make your point clear. And, and she's, a, she's a great proponent of that. Someone who uh, is a bit louder, a bit, <laughs> a bit more chaotic, uh, one of our absolute 
two favourites on the show, the wonderful Stuart Kenny. Uh, he was a guest of ours back in uh, season one. He's huge fans of all of his work. If you've not seen the Space Gecko Project, it is a thing of pure punny joy. Uh, Stuart's a very dynamic performer and he got in touch with us during lockdown. He had put a piece together, um, a kind of poetry film that he had made a beautiful piece about sort of being in the Pentlands a place that I know Stuart loves a great deal uh, yeah and we, we hope you enjoy it this is Redundant I do not feel redundant here there is no man on a wheelie chair asking me what I have to offer society frantically whirling around on his seat tie caught in the ceiling fan, so I can't be a hundred percent sure, but I do not feel redundant here, like the last four letters of the word Q, where a once new trainer turned dog's plaything, torn to pieces and left to be drowned and drool, devoid of function and shape. I am only calm, float with the breeze, feel the rough of a tree's bark touch the contours of my palm, and the soft of the ground give way beneath my tired tread. I am part of the ecosystem here, one part of everything else. I feel like I belong. The enigmatic Stuart Kenny there with Redundant. What a spectacular piece. And a huge thank you to Stuart for letting us feature that on the I Am Loud channel. You can see that and a huge um, array of poetry films on our channel. Do make sure to go and check them out. We've been doing a bunch of editing. We put out some of the Napo Rhymo poems that we did as kind of custom poetry videos. I know uh, Gally has been working on a bunch of those edits. Uh, we just put out one of his poems, uh, Eight Top Facts about BuzzFeed Space something. I've butchered his title. He'll be fine he doesn't mind uh, and he's putting out another one from Katie Ailes I think it should be out by the time you see this podcast Striptease which is very cool uh, we're, we're having a lot of fun putting together some of these videos but we have more live performances for you now and this is back from uh, uh, one of our, our birthday shows I think with uh, the the spectacular Jim Monaghan uh, I'm not sure if it was a birthday show but Jim is uh, just such a, a wonderful poet he is such a stalwart of the scene a true legend and this is one of his most iconic poems this is what I got for my birthdays I wrote this poem um, coming up eight or nine years ago now uh, for a birthday party for a guy called Matt McGee who I don't know if you know him he's a singer of the Gyro Babies and involved the, the wonderful Yellow Movement and other things and uh, he, has a, he has a great uh, podcast called You Call That Radio which is worth listening to he's quite a few poets on it and I wrote it uh, for Matt's birthday but uh, I am a poet so I wrote it about me not him <laughs> it's called What I Got For My Birthdays Age 6 Main Street Crooked Home me and my mum on the bus to Kilmarnock. And we went to the kiosk cafe for cheeseburgers and milk. And I got a Joe 90 doll. He was made of spongy, foamy rubber that I chewed and chewed and chewed all the way through to his 1960s skeleton. Metal spikes. <laughs> Age 12, Chapel Lane Golson. My dad said I was to get nothing because we'd went the week before to the children's panel. But I got sladest by Slade. And it was made of anthems, all stomping and chanting and strumming. And that kept me going until punk. Age 18, Gateside Road, Golson. I just got back for holiday that morning when we went, me and Gal, to a party in New Mills. And I got Susan Turner and a kicking for her boyfriend. <laughs> it's true. And she was made of smiles and eyes, all shiny and clever and beautiful. And I was in love for a while. Age 25, then gave old road Kilmarnock. Me and Mary were no long married when we went to Millport. Bed and breakfast, chips and bingo. And we got 
a baby on the way. And he was made of caring, sharing, tolerance, respect. And that present I got to keep forever. It, oh. <laughs> I'm available for pity sex later if I was. <laughs> <laughs> true again, true, true story. Um, <laughs> age forty, <laughs> Lamlash B. Aaron. They came from far and wide, but mainly Stuart and Falkirk, but quite far. <laughs> and we went to the beach with champagne and cake, and I got all my friends together in one place at one time, and that was made of Paul and Geraldine, Liam and Billy, Melanie and Molly. The kind of present you don't use all the time. You put it away, but it's there when you need it. Age 48, George McTurk Court, Cumnock. Woke up creaking. Not one single fucking present or card. So I went to my mum's for cheeseburgers and milk. And I got over 120 happy birthday messages on Facebook. <laughs> and they were made of digital signal and binary code. And later that night... Buoyed by my new popularity, I had an Asda meal for one. <laughs> and that was Jim Monaghan with what I got for my birthdays. The ray of sunshine that is Jim. Oh, how he makes me smile. And here to talk about the wonderful Jim Monaghan and all of her own amazing work, including slam successes and online productions and hosting of shows and all that good stuff, is the amazing Jenny Folds. Welcome to the show, Jenny. Thank you so much for coming on. How are you? Oh, surviving, getting there, you know, going slowly mad but uh yeah how are you getting on how's how's your pandemic been um i mean do you want the truth or no no, uh, no i mean the bloody truth uh yeah it's been peaks and troughs peaks and yeah, troughs yeah. <laughs> but i think it feels kind of almost normal um coming back to normality but I'm a, i don't trust it i'm a little bit like we're about to have the rug pulled away from us again <laughs> I mean, that's that's because you're an artist, Jenny. That's just how we always feel. That's our constant state of being. So obviously, you've had birthdays, right? Because we've been in this so bloody long. You've been in, you've had birthdays in lockdown. Were they as bleak as gyms? <laughs> um, I don't think they're as bleak as gyms. <laughs> um, I was. Do you know what? I was lucky enough that. So I'm born in October. I was forty in the October before the pandemic, and. Um, I had the most incredible birthday party uh, with ah. all my favorite people in in one house, in one, yeah, un under one roof. There was like 30 of my friends and we had the most fun. Um, and it was three, four months before lockdown. So I feel like I've been really lucky, even though last year's birthday was really kind of low key. But. Yeah. That is good. That's a lot of like uh, sort of psychic energy to get you through, right? Of <laughs> like you could uh, top up before you go into absolute isolation. That's very good to hear. Very good to hear. So, what did you think of uh, Jim's poem? Is it one you had heard before? I had never heard it before, um, but I really loved it. So nostalgic. Um, <laughs> he's kind of he's a bit of an enigma, isn't he? He kind of like. You, you think that he's kind of, I'm Jim. And then he comes out with that and it's like, obviously he rounds off with something um, equally as kind of <laughs> um, morose, but, but but I really loved it. I thought it was lovely. I, I, I always, I, I think whenever I do descriptions for Jim, like on, on you know, uh, copy, I am always, I always describe him as like a nostalgic melancholy of, or like bittersweet and stuff. Cause all of his poems are that kind of like, oh, I really recognize that. That's so, you know, lovely and and like you know harks back to childhood and stuff like that and then it's like i but it was shit though so it just undercuts everything but the, <sighs> but the thing is i think like with with his descriptions it each one of them is so gentle and um and thought of um you know when he's talking about like the first woman he fell in love with and he's talking about his son i just think it's just so yeah so beautifully descriptive, um, but yeah, yeah and, then the, and then the kind of slap in the face at the end. <laughs> what, what, it is one of the things Jim does just uh, better than anyone else I see, and it's a, a thing I think is kind of key to poetry, which is being 
kind of vague enough about stuff that people can lay their own experience over it, but being specific enough that people get the sensation that it's a true story, right? Like people don't want to understand everything in a poem. They want they want some things to provoke more questions than the answer, to be this, you know, these little glimpses into stories or memories or or feelings or thoughts. But like you it's a it's a hard line to walk before your poem just turns into like, well I have no idea what this is about because it's so specific to you. And, you know, oh it could be about any one generic love poem. And Jim walks that line flawlessly i think totally that's really interesting you said that i think i i I think that all the time i kind of sometimes when you listen to a song or or yeah like or you read a poem and it is really specific it's almost inaccessible because you're like oh that's that person's story and you can't it's almost unrelatable because you don't know exactly what happened in that situation (laughs) but you're right you're absolutely right i think and i you know i've not been writing long and um and that's one of the things that i've been learning is is to try and give the give the poem away so when you when the once you've written it and then you're performing it it doesn't belong to you anymore do you mean it kind of belongs to the other people listening to it and they're putting their own spin on it I a hundred percent agree. It's it's a thing I've uh, sort of talked previously about on the loudcast and stuff. The sort of the death of the artist, you know, that like yeah, once a piece is created, you you no longer hold on to it. People are going to put you know their own thoughts and and sort of assumptions onto it. And like I I think that absolves artists of a lot as well. Like when people go, oh, you've said this and you've said that and you mean this, and you're like, well, no, that's what you're taking from it you know it's once you've kind of released a piece out it's it's gone hannah lavery said a really interesting thing on the show uh, when she, when she was on which was uh, she was talking about doing a panel after uh, a performance and she was like i created i crafted this you know sort of play over three years and it said everything i wanted to say on this subject and then i walk out after it and sit down at a panel and someone goes so what do you think about da 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 and she's like oh no 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 i'm never going to be as articulate here as i was in the piece you know what i mean you should sometimes just look at the artist's work and take what you want to take from it I think yeah totally I think I think you know sometimes you write something and it's quite it's quite straightforward and simple and then you speak <laughs> to someone afterwards and they've really analyzed it and you're like <laughs> Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's you're kind of like looking at it far more cerebrally than I <laughs> thought about like when I when I wrote it. So I, I always say when I first got into poetry, I was like, the reason I'm doing poetry is because I want to like get successful enough to go back to my own old high school and have like while one of my poems is being taught and like kick the door in and just be like it just rhymed the curtains just happened to be blue there's nothing to it <laughs> yes like... i hated this fucking place <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's really interesting you say that you are are kind of new to writing because uh, it, it's fascinating to see the, the sort of previous few episodes of the loudcast people like uh, joe gilbert and courtney stoddart have been on the show and both of them are, are so new to the scene but have absolutely exploded in, in kind of what they're doing and they're getting so much work and so much sort of interest in commissioned pcs or already kind of branching out in a spoken word theater and that and you are someone who i feel like i've always known in the scene i feel like you're this sort of established person everyone knows josh she's you know won all this stuff and da, da, da. and then i've found out you had only like started writing in what like 2018 something like that yeah yeah i kind of like um i so i had acted for many years for like 14 years um when it, from when i was about 16 and um and i hadn't performed in almost 10 years i'd kind of like the the my acting career kind of it broke my heart a little bit and I was like never again I'm never doing it again I'm never performing again and then my friend asked me to write to do the address to the laddies at Burns Night and I'd never written anything before and um, I, I was like absolutely not I'm not doing it not not performing again um, and she's like well you just think about it would you just kind of like would you just start writing something and see how you feel and I went all right I'll start writing something and see how I feel and then started writing this thing and I was like, oh, I actually quite like that. And then and then it kind of grew arms and legs. It took me months to write. It took me about three months to write it. Um, and then I did, I, I performed it at this Burns night and, it, and my friend videoed it. And it, the, the video itself got viewed 15,000 times on Facebook. <laughs> um, and That's it fine. was, it, the funny thing about watching that video now when I watch it, like I feel like my life changed in that moment. 
It was like, I nailed, I nailed it. <laughs> I wrote this thing. I got up in front of a room full of, I think about 200 people, nailed it. And then it was like a light bulb moment. I was like, I remember you. I remember this feeling. I remember you. And I remember, <laughs> how, I remember how this feels. Oh no, I'm addicted again. So, so it, but it's like a really different, it feels really different. And that was, that was, that was, yeah, three, three years ago, three and a half years ago. It's fascinating. It's, it's, I always, I always love the stories of how people came into spoken word because it's, it's not like a lot of other art forms where people were like, well, you know, I grew up listening to tons of spoken word and I've decided I wanted to be a spoken word artist and here, here I am. It's, everyone has a, a kind of very obscure way that they've stumbled in and then they found it and went, ah, and it's like that penny drop moment um, of, oh, this is the thing. And I was very similar to you. I was like, I had performed for years, you know, I was like a theatre kid and wanted to be an actor and all that. Uh, and then I had, I was having a sort of bad mental health spell. spell and in that period, I decided to do, try stand up. Went horribly wrong. And I just didn't perform again for like six years. I just went, oh, this is not for me then. And it wasn't until I got back into spoken word that I was like, oh no, this is, this is incredible. Uh, so that's, it, it, it's, yeah, it's really interesting to see. And I think especially from, you know, that kind of like acting background, like I, I found it very liberating to be able to like write and direct and produce and just be my own entire thing. And if, um, we, we, we kind of found a quote from you when we were, Katie was researching the show, which was you described yourself as only kind of becoming uh, creative, like in your mid thirties after you had done acting for like, you know, close to 15 years and then, you know, not done it. And so I was like, that's so interesting to me that like you don't define that as a kind of creative you know, period. It feels different. It's it's really it's really it's really hard to explain. Um, you know, I started. I got my first professional job when I was seventeen, and I got an agent when I was seventeen. So I didn't go to drama school or anything. Right. I always had a bit of imposter syndrome about that, um, <laughs> it, which is hilarious because then I work. You know, I did, I was, I'm really proud of the work that I did. It was all film and telly. I didn't get to do theatre much because. I think that there's there's an element of you know with drama school you kind of learn the the craft of theatre um, at drama school and I didn't really have the you know I've done a couple of theatre things when I was I did a lot of youth theatre um, yeah um, when I was younger but as, as an adult I didn't do theatre um, and as much as I I mean I really like I say I really love the work that I did I'm really proud of it and um, I. Th- do you feel it? There was there's an element when you're acting that um, well when you're kind of starting out and you're not a big name and you don't have much clout, you're kind of you know you you're you're being told where to stand, what to wear, like what makeup to wear, like the light, what lighting there is. There you have the input in that that you're you know you're delivering lines in in the way that. That the only you can because you that's why you've been cast but there's also an element of you don't have much control of that and mm-hmm. um what i found was when i when i gave up acting which was it was a process of a couple of years to actually come to terms with the fact that the thing that you always wanted isn't the thing that's going to happen um I I didn't really do much for a couple of years i was working in the city in in london in the gherkin uh, for an asset management <laughs> company of all things and um and uh i i really had a, a huge gap a huge like hole in my life and it was this creative outlet i didn't i had always had with acting um so i started this website called happy graffiti which was um which was about basically promoting positive vandalism. It was like nice things people wrote on walls, and I would just go and take pictures of all these like this these these nice things that people have written on walls, um, and I ended up getting a book published uh, because of it, um, and did this like did it for like six or seven years, and it was a great creative outlet. I got really into the street art scene and um, like like became pals with loads of street artists and graph writers and and kind of promoted them and interviewed them and was just really interested in it um so when i kind of had given that up again there was this like this 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 gap in my life this creative outlet um and that's when spoken word came along which kind of came along at the right time for me 
Um, so back to your point, I think from a creative point of view, as I, I, as much as the acting is creative, um, for me to have the liberation to create and have ownership of something, um, it wasn't until um, I didn't act anymore. That's what I meant by that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. That it's a, it's a fascinating kind of outlook on it, because um, acting is 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 an odd. Yeah, it's this kind of odd duck in it, it, the the sense that you require someone else's art kind of to do yours. Like you know, the thing that really appeals to me about spoken word is that it's I do the writing and I decide you know the, the everything about it. Right, it's it, the entire creation counts within spoken word. And I just feel that when you're you're sort of acting like yeah, like you said, especially on TV or whatever, when it's you know first starting out, if it's a lot of like corporate stuff and that, it's not even you know rangy performances that you want to do and things like that it's i i see why a lot of like actors or whatever that stumble into spoken word feel very liberated by it how did you find the the sort of the transition then of being like so once you started you you did that sort of burns gig and, and then when and you got kind of the the bug from there did you dive into the the spoken word scene was it like hitting up open mics and stuff what was your your approach well i mean um it, i i i think i think of myself as really lucky in that actually the reason i even did this the the burns the burns thing in the first place was i had this um this life coach i had a life coach ali who who um who changed really changed my life he 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 got me from a point of going i'm never acting again i'm never going to perform again to like hungry for it and um, he really changed my outlook on self-belief and and purpose i suppose for all intents and purposes but um uh so when i done the once like that that night when I did the Burns night um performance, I sent him the video and I was just like I did it like this is thing and he's like I'm so proud of you he was just like me mega proud of me and it was like I was really proud of myself and he was like right the next session I had with him he what we, he would do is he would set me two goals at the end of every session, we had which would drive me to to kind of move things on. I'm a big procrastinator, um, and um, and in fact, I've just uh, through lockdown, I've had an ADHD diagnosis, and it's right. it's it's been really it's been really interesting to kind of like all, all like all of a sudden I can put a name to the things I couldn't quite articulate, um, yeah. and I have I sometimes get really paralysed by procrastination. So having a life coach was really. Um, really enriching, but also like it was a game changer for me. It really pushed me to do stuff that I would never have done before. So he said to me the next one of the the next session that I had with him, um, he said, "Right, that video, the video you sent me, send it to five, five comedy nights or spoken word nights and see what comes back." Um, and I was like, right, okay, oh God. And I was like, <laughs> I don't really know how I feel about that, but fine, I'll do it. And actually, I only sent it to one. Only sent it to one, and I ended up. Um, Ali will be outraged when they see this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I only, I exactly. I only sent it to one, but that one that I sent it to, I ended up being a resident poet with, and it's um, it's a night called Rhymes with Orange in London, um, who have been running for eight or nine years, I think now. Um, but I ended up. I, I did I, I did a open mic with them and then I won the open mic and the prize was you get a ten minute slot the next the next night. <laughs> it's always the prize for slams, Jenny. More slams. Or yeah, more, more slams. Why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then and then they they asked me to go on a writing retreat with them because there's basically they have a they have a they're a collective. So I went on a writing retreat with them and um, again game changer doing writing exercises like to um, write, write, getting a 10 minute writing exercise, having to stand up instantly and read, and read out what you've written. So without any editing, without per trying to perfect it. And it really, doing that over and over again with this bunch of people who love doing this thing was so kind of, I uh, don't know, shaping for me um, and liberating in itself because actually what it does is it, it, it leads you not to be uh, like precious about the, the stuff you write and, and yeah. it allows you just to, you know, get rid of the imposter syndrome where you think you've got to perfect something before you stand up and do it. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up kind of becoming a part of their collective and we would write 10 minutes of new material every month 
um, and perform it every month. Um, and yeah, and it kind of like grew arms and legs from that, really. Um, I kind of started Rebel so um, I've got a night, or oh, before the weird times, I had a night in London <laughs> called Rebel Soapbox, um, which was kind of off the back of that. I was like, oh, um, I'd quite like to try doing that, like kind of running my own night. And which in itself was amazing because it was like, you know, then kind of curating a night. I mean, you'll know from doing Loud Poets, like curating a night, you know, getting, having um, different performers that will complement each other that are different enough that keeps it interesting, but are similar enough that it puts a thread through it. It's, you know I mean? it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. I, for example, uh, we had you in uh, again, back in the normal times during Fringe uh, and uh, uh, one of the things I tried to do, we did best of Fringe. And so we had uh, 69 poets over the month. Uh, and it was, you know, sort of lineups of three, right? And so like the night you were on, a great example is like, it was you, Paul Case and Jemima Foxtrot. And you're like, what a, you know, like Paul has all this sort of like punk, angsty, like energy. And then Jemima is this kind of like beautifully sculpted poetry, but a much more kind of like low key, you know, re relaxed vibe. And then you bring all this kind of like, positive energy that, that acts as a beautiful contrast to Paul and like you know th that's one of my favorite things to do is, is put together dynamic lineups it's, it's so much fun because spoken word has that range it's like it's so easy to do 100% and I think I think you know um, that was the thing that I really learned was once I kind of I think with Rhymes with Orange um, it, 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 it was it was such a safe space to do loads of different things and then I kind of started to become a little bit braver to go oh I'm going to try and do another open mic and see what that was <laughs> like and you know and then kind of get yourself out there and it's like it's I mean open mics are nerve-wracking because you've got a whole different audience of that you, that's never seen you before and doesn't understand what you do and you know like so you try and convey what you do within like three minutes or whatever however long it is but but um but yeah just kind of like uh understanding that the scene and the the the, the different the different uh, subject matters, the different uh, performance styles. Also, the what what has always struck me with the scene is like, you know, you, you get you get someone who's never done it before, and they stand up and they they absolutely nail it, and you're like, you've never done this before. This is amazing, and then you get someone who's been doing it for fifteen years, and they get up and they're obviously a master, but but it's a forum in which people who are brand new at it and old school at it can be on the same platform. And I think that's such Absolutely. a beautiful thing. Like, what other place do you get that? You don't get that. You don't get that really anywhere. Everyone, you know, when you think about, when you go to like um, live gigs or even, you know, like, um, like musicians obviously have to cut their teeth and they, they, they have to, you know, strive to get to a certain point where they can then get up on a stage with, another band who's been doing it for 15 years but it's kind of it's really uh, leveling i find it really leveling i think it's it is there's always the the pro and con right where it's like the one of the beautiful things about the spoken word scene even even in london where it's you know probably the most established in the uk it's still tiny and so you you get that blending right of people who have been doing it a very long time the distance or, or and who are very good at it the distance between them and someone doing it on their first night is you know not as huge as it is between like you know blockbuster oscar winner actor and someone at youth theater right it's just that that gap seems so much bigger and it's a it's a pity because the scene's so small and like i think while you I think there needs to be more professionalization. Like there needs to be bigger nights and things that, you know, like I, I would love to see a touring network and things like that where, you know, people can actually like just be a gigging poet and not have to also be a promoter or a workshop leader or a whatever. And so, but, but, but you need to also keep the open mic. And that's, it's, it's, it's so clear to me. People want to get into this like debate over, oh, should it be, you know, accessible and open mics or should it be, you know, curated and, and, you know, sort of high production. And you're like, you can do both. You can find a way to keep community and still like look to excel, you know, as a production. Definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think that's the thing with Rebel Soapbox would be, we would have an open mic. We would have six people, six or eight people on the open mic, and uh, we would have three or four people on the bill, like mm -hmm. named people. 
Um, and I mean, it's uh, my, my night was a small night. I mean, we're just about to open it up again. I think um, I'm going to do one in Brighton and I'm going to do one in London. Um, but and I'm, I'm now um, looking at right how like looking at the format uh, because I think it's really important also to pay pay your performers. Like I think yeah. it's like you know <clears throat> there's a lot of free gigs out there which is which is great. But also like if I'm you know if I'm making money on the door then the performers need to be paid. So that's that's it. Like a hundred percent. But but the, there's like to your point I think. Uh, the, the lack of professionalization within the the scene um kind of allows people not to do you know what I mean? yeah it can be it can be hard and people still want to perform and that's that's why you get you know like very like like total veterans at still doing open mics and stuff because if they don't it's not like being a comic where you can gig three times a week you know all year round like it just without the open mics how often would most poets be gigging to poetry audiences you know what i mean not not like you know, outside commission staff or, you know, this and that or like cabaret or whatever, but just like, here's an audience here for poems. And I was I was really um, pleased to hear that like with uh, Rebel Soapbox that like you did really well audience number wise and stuff in, in the first few shows you had. Like that's really encouraging to see that there's still space for more nights in London. That obviously means there's like an audience there. And you're looking, you were saying you're looking to expand to Brighton. That's really cool. Totally. I mean, <clears throat> I definitely think there's definitely space for it. And I think that there's also, you know, there aren't many female-led um, uh, uh, nights. <clears throat> and then also there's not many queer female nights led, <laughs> led nights. Do you know what I mean? So it's trying to keep it as diverse as possible. Um, I mean, we, we, we sold, I did six or seven, <clears throat> sorry, six, say six or seven shows in a row were sold out. It was a small room. I mean, it, it wasn't a big room, but we were sold out, and it was a great vibe. And it was like, and it, it, and what we found was actually a lot of the audience were like, I've never seen poetry before. I've never done. I've never seen spoken word before. I thought I would hate it, but actually, I really loved it. I thought it was really funny, but I thought it was heartfelt, and I thought it was this, and I thought it was that, and that's the audience we need to get in. Uh, absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, the thing is, <laughs> you know, you can go to a night and you've got an audience full of poets. That's great. <laughs> but but you need we need to tap into people who think they don't like poetry because they've been told that poetry is inaccessible to normal people. Whereas yeah. that's what spoken word does. It bridges the gap, right? It bridges the gap of going, actually, oh, right. I, oh, I didn't think I would enjoy that because actually all it is is like, it's a story. You've just told me a story that was really funny about you and your best friend getting off their face on pills. You know what I mean? Like, or you've just told me a story of heartbreak or your mum dying or your, you know, whatever story it is that is yeah. conveyed in that in that spoken word piece. But I think it's it, it feels like the bridge, the, it's bridging the gap to relatability. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. I think it's, it's always what we've aimed to do at Loud Poets. And, I, you know, I think you can see it in like, it's what you were saying as well, right? Uh, when we were talking about the, you know, how, how with Jim's poem, you need to be specific, but not too specific and general, but not too general. I think spoken word, you know, fits that mold. It fits there for audiences. Like people are intimidated by poetry. So like spoken word can be a good bridge to that. But I think in its own right, it is still its own independent thing. Like I love the dynamic performance of spoken word. I love the ability to do collab poems or to work with music and all that, that, that comes with it. And I think when you can get it in front of people, overwhelmingly the response is oh wow I did not expect poetry to be like this and I think that like stands out I think a good way to do it is slam which uh, obviously uh, I, was, I want to bring up with yourself as you are the current Scottish slam champion uh, congratulations and you came second in the world slam championships I can't believe it. Like literally, like I'm, I'm still a bit bamboozled by <laughs> all of it. Um, um, because you know, I talking about Jim. Um, I did so. I did a uh, a slam a competition for you call that radio with Mark on Mark McKee's um yes. podcast, which Jim actually spoke about in that video about birthdays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone should go and check out You Call That Radio. Uh, go support Mark McGee. He's amazing and the show is tremendous. Yeah. What a legend. Um, but he um, he was one of the judges in the slam competition. <laughs> um, uh, Jim was. Um, and, uh, and I'd never done a slam competition. But I'd never done slam before, really. I mean, 
when I say the thing is, I kind of look at slam and go, I mean, it's just it, well, it, I, it it relates because it's spoken word, but then it's the I just talk a lot, so I had to really amend. <laughs> I had to really like amend everything down to three minutes because it's yeah. obviously you get penalised if you go over. Um, but did uh, did a couple of rounds of slam uh, with with you call that radio. I mean, it's all it's all been online, so I can't wait for it to be in person again. But um, uh, then the prize for that was to be in the Scottish finals, and then I completely forgot about the Scottish finals, and nobody had really <laughs> told me about when they were. And I got an email the week of the Scottish finals saying, "We'll see you on Thursday," and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, right, okay, I need to, I need to like, I need to plan for this." And then um, did the Scottish finals? Yeah, won that, and I'm like, I couldn't believe it because. Um, you know, I, I see, I've, I've seen a few, few of the ex old winners talking about it. Um, and I was always like, wow, that would be such a cool thing to like be involved in or, or <laughs> win or like going to the world slam championships. Wow. That would be amazing. And then, so then it happened and it's kind of like, it's been really exciting. Um, I, I yeah, can't believe it did the world champs, but it was, it was like, come to Paris. It's going to be like an expenses paid trip to Paris from your living room on Zoom. <laughs> and you're like, oh God, when is this going to end? Um, but I had to like prepare six pieces um, and send them, send them over, send them to them like three months before the competition. So they would translate them. So basically they, what they do is they tra they have, they have the English at the top. They have translate them into French as well. And then they have, and then they have a box of your face. <laughs> so it's like, um, I think in real life they would have the translations behind you on on a big on a. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how they go. But but yeah, so I had to do six pieces. Um, did the semi-finals, got through to the final, did, did three rounds, got through to the final. Um, yeah, and came second. And there was like point seven of a point in it as well. Oh. It was like it was really close. But the guy from Italy who won is just amazing i mean he was extraordinary um but he's he's a part of a collective in uh in rome and he's invited me to come and perform with them which is which is amazing which is a lovely thing so we got we did that and then then the, we have the uk finals at the royal arbor hall <laughs> in the elgo room in the royal arbor hall at the end of so at the beginning of july which is in person so tickets have gone on sale and that's going to be incredible. And um, Catherine McFarlane and Sarah Grant are both from, so we're repping Scotland. There's three of us that are from <laughs> Scotland. Um, and I think there's about 20, 20 poets all kind of vying for the UK title. So, yeah. so if, if you're watching this, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume even if you're not in Scotland, you are a supporter of the Scottish spoken word scene because that's all we talk about. So go and check out uh, the Hammer and Tongue uh, UK National Slam uh, and go and support Catherine and Sarah and uh, Jenny. They are all, yeah, we're massive fans of the three of them and they've all served Scotland proud. I know Catherine uh, went to Worlds as, as a Scottish Slam champion uh, and Sarah is just, well, she's been on the show. Everyone knows Sarah. She's lovely. Uh, that's going to be yeah a, what what a team to send down i did want to scratch your head because i do find it interesting and it's like you know it's conversations that come up regularly around spoken word and i think uh, or slam in general and i think you're a very specific like interesting and specific uh specifically good example is so because the the sort of slam thing is, is still so loosely organized you have a situation where we have like you're the scottish slam champion and you went to worlds but then you're qualifying for the UK Slam champion who goes to Worlds. Because obviously, well, you were there, uh, I think it was Catherine O'Driscoll, right? Who was the um, uh, UK representative, right? Yeah. Uh, and you're going, to, well, it's so strange. Um, and like, obviously, because you are someone who is Scottish, uh, but you are based in London. And so like, uh, oh, sorry, Brighton. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of down south, and so it's it's always that interesting thing of like when I look at like the slam. Obviously, it's different with digital. Is like we, we've had issues in the past where not issues, but like where someone very new to the scene who's only kind of like coming up briefly wins nationals, and, and and you wonder like how does that plug into the Scottish scene in general? Um. So how how do, how are you feeling about being like you, you know? Scotland's champion having to still go and qualify 
you know, as part of the UK thing. Is is, is there any issue with that for you? Or like, what, what's your thought? There's no, there's no issue. I mean, it was Robin Cairns who runs the Scottish um, Sam Championships mm-hmm. who actually got in touch with me and he said, I've got in touch with them and I've said that you should be competing at, at the UK finals as part as uh, he's like go and like be part of the representation for Scotland because I think that's that's like it's important that there is representation I mean given the political landscape it's like so <laughs> controversial because <laughs> like, uh, yeah I mean because it comes to those things of like because I, I, I have issues with even the Scottish Slam Championship is always in Glasgow right yeah and why the, not in Edinburgh the, yeah, the the or anywhere else outside the central belt, maybe uh, the UK national slam is always at the Royal, Royal Albert Hall in London, and you go, does that does the, do those things have an impact, or you know, what I mean, like on on Scottish artists being able to access it, Welsh artists, you know, Northern Irish artists being able to access it, or like yeah, if the Scottish situation, people being outside the central belt, because like for example, yourself, would you have been able to do the Scottish Slam Championship if it wasn't digital, right? Because I, well, I don't know. I mean, we, like, well, I suppose that's 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 the question. At the time, actually, when I was doing the Scottish Slam Championship, I was in between houses, and I'd, I had moved out of London, and I was actually up in Edinburgh a fair bit over lockdown. Ah, nice. Do you know what I mean? I was kind of like, I was yeah, like yeah. in between, I was in between, I didn't really know what I was up to. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so actually, actually, because I got made redundant. And so I was like, Oh no. Like, so, I mean, literally like life falls apart during lockdown. It's, yeah. like, it's like a nightmare. But it was a bit of a saving grace, actually. The, the, the Sam stuff was a bit of a saving grace because it was, it was something that I could focus on. Yeah. Um, but I was definitely kind of in between places. I didn't really know where I was going to be. So I would have loved sense to have you know competed even though if it wasn't on, if it wasn't dig- digital yeah. i think i think it's just something where you know when we talk about like the accessibility and like bringing new audiences in and stuff i think slam could be such a good tool for that and i think it would just it would serve obviously it's difficult to do you know it's easy to talk in the hypothetical and like the people running these you know big slams and stuff do an incredible job to put them together and you know give those opportunities to like go to worlds and stuff to to spoken word artists but i feel there's there's just a we're we're getting to a stage where something slightly more thought out and like regional qualifiers or whatever could be a huge step in like raising the profile of the spoken word scene. Hundred percent. I think I think you're right. I think that there definitely has to be. I think for for it to to be equal, I think that there needs to be more structure around it. Um, you kind of go, well, is there? A, I don't know whether there's a Welsh champion. I don't know whether there's a Northern Irish champion. Yeah. I don't know if there's an English champion, and then at which point. Should we then all go to the UK? Do you know what I mean? It, it should be tiered yeah. probably a little bit better. But I think that Hammer and Tongue do amazing things. And I think oh, they are, um, they're really kind of, the, I think I think there's an, is there another, I think there's, there might be another slam, UK slam thing <laughs> that happens. I think, they, I, think I don't Pro- know whether probably. there's a bit of, um, not controversy, but I, I think there's a little bit of overlap. So I don't think it's been thought of I think that it's going to start being thought of more as it gets more popular. You know, yeah. you think about Life and Rhymes, um, this spoken word show uh, that just won a BAFTA uh, with Benjamin, uh, uh, introduced or um, hosted by Benjamin Zephaniah. Um, that's like a real coup for for, for spoken word, Mad. like ag- against like Ant and Dex. Saturday Night Takeaway or Strictly or you know, and then you've got the spoken word. Uh, the spoken word show that's won this BAFTA, and I think that's the, that. It, it feels like that's a sign of things to come as this as it gets more popular. There, there, something like slams, especially when it comes to titles, should there should be maybe a little bit more structure put around it. Yeah. And well, Jenny, go and win the UK National Slam from Hammer and Tongue and lead the charge. Demand that they hold the next one in Scotland. I'll back you up. Uh, but no, it, it, like it is good. It, like I and I, I don't mean to you know be critical of the organisation and stuff. Like I said, people do an amazing job, often for very little like remuneration on their own part uh, and, and stuff. It is difficult to do, but I, I think you're right. Like we should be capitalising on these things as much as possible. Uh, and it is nice to see more Scottish representatives heading down uh, and then going to like compete i think we stand a really good chance with the three of you uh heading up and if you have not checked out life and rhymes is it still available on the iplayer do you know i, I think so yeah it's sky arts um uh, you know, sky arts oh, sky so arts. you can get it on now tv or sky 
Um, it was, I mean, great, really well put together, um, like showcase for for some incredible like uh, poets. Yeah, yeah. For those for those that don't know, it was a, a show put together, really well produced, really beautifully shot. Uh, obviously, Benjamin Zephaniah being the kind of lead on it is what, he's so talented. What an amazing uh, poet! Um, and obviously, Jenny was involved, and uh, Image and Sterling uh, involved, and stuff like that. It's so lovely to see folk that you know from from where we seen getting uh getting in the mix with the baftas very very cool do you know i mean it was it, i mean i actually i kind of i kind of snuck in um i, got, <laughs> I had i had take i had tickets with my um my friend my friend uh, who's an amazing poet is he was meant to be doing it and for some reason he didn't end up doing it but we went along to the right. night it was up battersea um battersea park in london and um, what they did was they pulled, they had six poets um, who were going to do like kind of a full kind of four minute piece or whatever. And then they did an open mic session and I put my name in the hat. There was about 40 people in the hat and there was four of us that got pulled for it. So we got to do like even just like a short like minute, minute blast. But it was like, you know, it just get being being there on the, that night. I think they did six consecutive nights um, where they did six six lots of six and then like an open mic every night as well get being involved in that it just feels like i don't know it's just like a little step towards what i think is going to come next for spoken words i think it's going to be i think we've got quite a lot of exciting stuff coming up really I really hope so. I, I hope you're right. And it does, it does feel, you know, people are, per, are ever more organized, ever more resourceful, you know, ever building those skill bases and connection bases and, and stuff. And it's, yeah, it looks like, like things are on the up. So hopefully, uh, and I know you're going to be a big part of that, Jenny, uh, both as a promoter and as a performer, like it's, yeah, very, very cool. And thank you so much for coming on the Loudcast and chatting to us. Uh, before you go, I was wondering, would you mind uh, giving us a wee, a wee poem, giving us a bit of a read? Yeah, totally. I would love to. Um, I'm going to do um, a, a, a two kind of two pieces that kind of run into each other. I was I was asked to um, write something for the Old Market Theatre in Brighton um, as part of their reigning women season. Um, and it was the first live stream that they were going to do from the venues. So they had this five camera set up and we had like there was musicians, there was a rapper, there was stomp, you know, the percussionists. Um, and I kind of wrote this thing about basically about what we've all just been through and it's called Loss, Hope and Thoughts Becoming Things and I'm going to do Hope and Thoughts Becoming Things for you now. Amazing. Okay. Far in the distance, it started as a murmur. They could feel a stampede heading in their direction. They don't even know it yet, but this unmistakable force hurtling towards them is hope. Rushing through the dark, dank and dusty landscape, pushing past this desolate destruction, galloping towards them fast and furious. They have reached the bottom and now the only way is up. And this hope starts to awaken, flickering inside of them, igniting one by one, whispering, which starts to stoke the fire faster, the whisper turning into chatter, the chatter turning into inspiring conversation, and this hope rumbles on from person to person. There is no stopping it now. Rushing from cities through villages and towns, this hope has become a chorus of joy and glorious technicolour, laughing and drinking, dancing and singing, outpouring love, creative thinking. The salty sea air in your face and the sound of muffled beats beating from the beach bars that are open and full of people exchanging their best banana bread recipes happiness found in a field festivals for days and we will go be together in the after haze going to the cinema to eat your body weight in popcorn flip down seats that ask for no feet up on them the lights are dimmed time is suspended the rustling sounds of bags of sweets and being shushed by the old lady sitting in the front seats a party with all your favorite people in one room reminiscing and talking of all the missing when that song that everybody knows the words to drops sweet dreams are made of them 
There are hands in the air and twirling round, all your friends singing at the tops of their voices is the most perfect sound. Arms around necks and swaying, busting out dance moves to the music's playing, propping up the bar with cocktails and dreams, finishing each other's sentences to get the punchline in. Jack and Ori's story time with everybody listening and joining in. I'll never take this for granted, ever again. The gratitude that will stay with us. This is paradise. The ordinary never felt so good. So that's hope, and this is stops becoming things. The ordinary grew as the days go by, and they realised that this normal, the thing that they knew before, it just wasn't good enough. Not in an ungrateful way, but the lessons and the loss were telling. When they had all that stuff taken away, they could see the beauty in the mundane and have gratitude for a sunny day. The simpler things that they took no notice of in a busy world, a cuddle from a best friend or making a cup of tea for your mum. Seeing the loss in a different way, as an opportunity to grow. And the lessons started to push out of them, unstoppable, thoughts becoming things, thoughts becoming real things. Imagine this. They first notice it on a Tuesday morning when the bank accounts of all NHS workers have large deposits of money in them. The politicians refuse their pay rises and the posh man with the shit hair steps aside for someone less posh, more worthy, more humble and who has better hair. And all the old ladies and all the old men could leave the care homes and see their families again. And out on the beach, on deck chairs with stripes, with ice creams and swimmers that are too tight, they bask and they laugh and their families are with them. And there are murmurations that spell out celebrations in their giant flock formations. And Joe Wicks will give them exercise classes, but in real life. And Zoom will come up with a new concept, not an online experience, but an in-person experience. And they will call it living. And no one will ever have to make banana bread ever again. And Piers Morgan will be he Meghan and Harry's gardener, and he will just be grateful for the gainful employment. And we will look up from our phones. And there will be a festival every day by order of the new brilliant government just so we can be together. And there will be an end to the glamorization of being busy. And the act of meeting up with friends will get an OBE from our qu the Queen. And our bodies will be given medals for taking us places when we couldn't go anywhere. And there will be a week of public holidays to remember the people who were taken and the time that was lost. And the word Trump will be erased from our brains and the Karens of the world will chill the fuck out and we will be allowed to protest again, but we won't have to protest again because there'll be a new level of understanding and the sun and the waves will be the only energy we will ever use again. And we will evolve and we will become more thoughtful. We will be kinder to others. We will use our bodies more and our imaginations will be the thing that we look to for guidance for what is next. And what is next? will be wonderful and we will change the narrative thoughts becoming things thoughts becoming real things thank you wow jenny stunning stunning stuff although i, I mean i was i was with you right up until no one will have to make banana bread again i don't want to live in that world uh, <laughs> No, I did truly, truly spectacular stuff. I, the the um the sort of full piece that you did, you know, just kind of briefly was was incredible. It's available on YouTube, guys. There's a link in the eye up in the corner. I absolutely advise you go and check out the full thing. What what a cool thing to to uh, put together during the pandemic and the writing. Ah, uh, it's just so wonderful, Jenny. You're always just that nugget of joy you know what i mean it's like it's like it's like the opposite of jim who is who is who is like in the big cloud with the silver lining you're like the the sort of big white fluffy cloud with a hint of gray like it's you know it's yeah it's so nice it's so nice uh, Ah, oh, joy stuff. And if you want to see more from Jenny, uh, she's going to be reading another poem on the Loudcast Extra over on our Patreon channel. You can go and check that out. Hey, we're going to be chatting about uh, that poem and getting, getting into her practice and, and, and things like that. So it's going to be a good chit chat. And in the meantime, do go and check out all of Jenny's other work. You can find her on Twitter. What's your at, Jenny? Um, I'm at Jenny with words on Jenny Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. 
Good, good, good. Uh, and there'll be links, obviously, down in the description below if you're watching this on the YouTube version. If you are watching this on the YouTube version, please do like, subscribe, all of that good stuff. Uh, and go check out more spoken word poetry because it's, uh, yeah, it's so much fun. And like Jenny said, we're hoping there are big things on the horizon. So, yeah, go and check it all out. But this, for now, has been the Loudcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.